He stood at the gate, watching her. The last of the sunlight faded as she washed the window. She propped the long black brush against the wall and threw the water against the glass. When the water stopped dripping and left only black marks on the stonework, she looked up at the sky, one hand holding back her hair, her overall whipping in windy spirals. Then she lifted the pail and went round to the back of the cottage. The house stood secure against the wind, not a pane open, not a curtain flapping, but over the roof a long grey whisker of smoke wagged and vanished. His eyes caught the grey smoke and lost it in the clouds. One fire, he thought, hard up or thrifty. Up in an attic he saw her thin form clouding a window, a yellow duster hasting over the ledges and polishing the glass. The man closed the gate and went round to the back of the house. Compared with the trim stonework and the well-graveled path he had seen, the back regions were neglected and even poor. The worn rope mat on the step, the scrabblings of pipe clay on the flags, the tangled old washing cloths on the window looked as if they had been untouched for months. Behind the garden wall were a few fruit trees in a group too small to be called an orchard. Above the stonework he could see the boughs heavy with apples like round red lanterns waiting to be lit, and in the garden itself, where a tree overhung the wall, apples littered the ground and gathered. He rattled the knocker, a short staccato knock, and listened to the footsteps coming downstairs. The girl opened the door, harassed looking, her prettiness half hidden under dust cap and overall. She brushed back her hair and straightened her apron to neatness. The man began to speak in a high, sibilant voice. His dress was soberly respectable, a black overcoat and a bowler hat. His hands were empty and there was no suitcase at his feet, but he had the indescribable obsequious cheerfulness of the man with something to sell. His blue chin doubled itself over a white collar and his large nose swelled under oval gold spectacles. Good afternoon, he said with a little bow. I wonder if you have any gold to sell, any watches, rings, sorry, nothing like that. Her voice cut across the hiss of his recital. No watches, rings, lockets, brooches, bangles, no false teeth. No, I'm sorry. He waggled his hands ingratiatingly, then put them behind his back, bowing forward again and looking at his bright, unspecked boots. Any brass candlesticks? Lots of you young people can't be bothered cleaning them nowadays. We give very good money for all brass wear. Any brass toasting forks, watch chains, brass plaques, anything that looks like brass. No, nothing like that. She forced finality into her tone, but the man had his piece well rehearsed and defied all efforts to put him off. Any brooches? Any hatpins? Any hair slides? Spectacle frames? Cufflinks? Pendants? Any old beads? Any... He moved nearer, as if struck with an idea. Any old Woolworth pearls? Or sixpenny rings? We pay good money, madam. We buy anything at all, anything usable that you might put out to salvage. I might... His ear caught at the phrase, and he nodded to hasten her decision. I've got... One or two odds and ends upstairs, but I don't think... Let me have a look at them, madam. Just one glance. I won't press you to sell if you don't want to. Just let me see them. Anything you have. Any old watches, chains, beads, bangles, cutlery. His sibilant, coaxing chant followed her as she retreated. She left the door open, and he could see into the house, into the cold stone scullery edged with a smudged border of rubbing stone. It was all very neglected out of keeping with the picture of the girl as he had first seen her, cleaning inside and out with a sort of nervous energy, as if afraid that her work would mount up and get on top of her. She was a long time coming down. The rain began to spit in cold, wet flurries. Autumn had come suddenly, with the world cold and wet, the trees strip-teasing, bearing themselves slowly to the last leaf. He stepped inside the door, sheltering himself without intruding, peering abstractedly into the scullery at the bread bin on the shelves and the ringer lying against one wall. 
He could hear the woman walking about upstairs, moving indecisively, straying away on willful paths of carpeting. He stood back a step when she appeared, thrusting a glittering handful of junk at him. There was a chromium scarf pin with two brilliants missing, a jangling necklace of pearls without a catch. Are these any good? she asked, half ashamed of offering them to him, half eager for him to take them. He turned them to the light, looking them over critically. That's the stuff, he said. All these things, you see. I'll give you two and six. All right, she said doubtfully. If you can use them. Oh, I can use them. I've got a market for them. There's a great demand for these things, you know. People will buy anything nowadays. Anything at all. And glad to get it. Anything else in that line now? Lockets? You haven't an old locket, have you? No. Any ornaments? Paperweights? Fancy buckles? Rings? Brooches? Chains? Watches? Any old watches? No. I'm sorry. I wonder, though... Could you wait a second? I might have another old necklace or something if you waited till I had a look. Certainly, certainly. Anything you care to show me. Anything you want to sell. Earrings, fancy clasps, fountain pens, brass pokers. She brought down a china jug stamped with the exhibition line of 1939. A crescent-shaped badge with Blackpool on it, an enameled mug and a gollywog brooch bought with marmalade tokens. She had in her apron pocket a necklace of shells, and an ugly little pebble brooch with a broken pin. She held them out, feigning indifference as he priced them. Four and six, he said. Five shillings. He looked at her, noting that she was ready to bargain. Very well, he said willingly. We won't haggle over sixpence. Are you sure that's all? No old paperweights, paper knives, crockery, glassware, light shades... No vases, tin trays, bird cages, musical instruments. I've a mouth organ, she said, not meaning him to take her seriously. Then, as she saw his eagerness, she spoke more earnestly. It's been lying about for a while, but it was a good one. I'll look at it, he said. When she was away, he looked once more at the bright little knick-knacks she had given him. A few touches, and they would be unrecognisable, and almost better than new. Then he would sell them in a completely different place and gain commission on sales. It was a grand business, if you knew how to work it. Before she offered him the mouth organ, running to him with it eagerly as a child, she polished it on her apron. The man put it to his mouth, his lips curling up as he played a few soft notes. Suddenly it struck him that he was being ridiculous, a sober old man in spectacles breathing into a mouth organ. He laughed, and the girl laughed too, nervously, as if afraid to offend him. He jumped to business again, but now more indulgently, as with one with whom he had shared an experience. It's quite a good one. Worn, of course, but usable. Two shillings? It cost eight and six new, she said. Ah, but it's not new now, he grinned warily. Half a crown? Well, all right, she said. After all, well, my husband's just been called up. A soldier's pay. I thought, the little extra? Oh, yes, I see. He juggled the mouth organ up and down, throwing it up and catching it again. It was raining hard now, blowing sideways like a brown veil, and the wind tugged at the trees behind the wall. He stepped again into the shelter of the passage, and the girl stepped back, uneasily, not sure whether to rebuke or condone the liberty. He felt the uncertainty of her attitude. A girl all alone in the house, and, to hide the realisation, he started off on his patter again. If you had anything else, I could. You haven't any alarm clocks or enamel pans, no old suits or ladies' jumpers, boots, shoes, slippers, propelling pencils... No, she said. That's all, really. He looked at her, at the pretty face dust-smudged, the hands glazed with floor polish and the handles of brushes. Suddenly he wanted to stroke her hair, to pat her shoulder, to hold her in his arms and feel the smallness of her as she struggled against him. 
The feeling was so strong that he had to turn away and look out at the wet garden with the apples leaning over the wall. He hummed, coughed, and turned back to her with his hands in his pockets. What he had to do was to be generous to her, to make up for the way he had swindled her. Well, not swindled exactly. He had a market for the things she hadn't. He had paid her as much as he'd ever paid anyone. But the profit of the transaction would go to him, and he felt that somehow it ought to go back to her. It was ridiculous. He did not love the girl. He did not even know her. And his brief moment of desire had passed. But there remained the idea of being kind to her in a fatherly way. He coughed again and rattled the money in his pockets. Tell you what, he said. I can't give you any more than this. It's not my money, see, and I'm not allowed to give more than a certain amount. But I thought, if you could let me have a few apples. Well, I don't know, she said. They're not mine, really. You'd have to take the windfalls. Mr. Robertson lets me have those. They'll do, they'll do, if you could just let me have a bag or something. All right, you gather them and I'll see what I can do. He crossed the wet green, silver beads of rain rolling from the grass as he passed. His hands sank up to the cuffs in dank greenness. His fingers rounded the sweet smoothness of apple after apple. When he had gathered as many as he could carry, he waited at the door until the girl returned with a large bag. He felt wet and uncomfortable, and as his wet cuffs chafed at his wrists, all his feeling for her disappeared in irritation. She was too thin, too anxious-looking, and he was making a fool of himself. He counted the apples, judged the weight expertly, and gave a market price and not a penny more. Well, he said, setting his hat right, settling his coat collar, it's time I went on my way. His voice seemed to wheeze. Any time you have anything else, any time you're spring cleaning, just put all your old jewellery, all your odds and ends aside. Yes, she said. Thank you very much. He raised his hat with a flourish, waving it above his bald brow. Without the bowler, he looked like a lizard. She watched his black, rigid back disappearing down the path. His boots were still brilliant, and one ungloved hand swung soft and plump by his side. His pocket showed no sign of the glittering trash he carried. He had dropped one apple at the edge of the green. She stepped out into the rain, lifted it up, and took a bite out of it. The rain on the peel mingled with the juice in her mouth, watery sweet, and her strong white teeth chewed the fruit in crisp bites. But all the time she ate, she was thinking, not of the apple, but of the money, and her hand held on to the silver as if she would never let go.